Hello. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us here today. Um, so you founded BuzzFeed in 2006 while you were still at Huffington Post. Um, what did you originally envision the company to be? And is that different to the way that the company has evolved over the years? Yeah, so when, when BuzzFeed started, it wasn't really ever designed to be a company. Um, I, I had started Huffington Post uh, a couple years earlier. And before that, I was doing, um, I, I had worked in technology research. Mm -hmm. So I was always more interested in building a lab and experimenting, trying to understand things, not necessarily saying, I want to create some big company. Um, and so as Huffington Post was taking off, uh, I wanted to have an outlet to experiment with new ideas in, in media and technology. And so BuzzFeed set up this little office in Chinatown in New York City. And we were about five people. Um, and we were um, really a lab. We weren't trying to, to, to build a, a company. Um, and it wasn't until Huffington Post sold later that, and I had gotten interested in entrepreneurship and building companies that I had that itch to turn BuzzFeed into a, in, into a company. So we mm -hmm. raised money and from venture, venture capitalists and we started to, to build it into a company. So originally I was just trying to understand this simple question of why do some ideas spread and other ideas don't spread? Why do people share things, certain things with each other and not other things? Um, what does it mean if the world changes so that people get information from their friends sharing things and not from broadcast or the traditional gatekeepers or newspapers. Uh, and I wanted to, I did, it seemed like a huge shift that was happening in the world and I wanted to try to understand what that shift meant. Mm -hmm. So the company's witnessed incredible growth since you set it up um, and it's now international. Um, did you face any challenges when it came to the international growth and development? Um, we started growing internationally in, a, in, in fairly organically. Mm -hmm. So some, uh, uh, a guy, uh, Luke Lewis, was working for another media company in London, and he said the main thing they kept asking him to do was copy BuzzFeed. So they would, he, he would see something that was made in the US at BuzzFeed that was doing well, like a list or a quiz or a new format, um, and then he was making versions of BuzzFeed, and they were doing really well. And so he came to us and he said, why, why don't you just hire me and I'll start BuzzFeed UK and, and we can start with a small team and we can take the best stuff from BuzzFeed and, and, and then um, see what works in the UK and, and expand. So he, he built a small team and by the time um, we had really th th started thinking about any kind of international strategy, we already had a big audience in the UK and um, it was spilling over into Australia. We had about a million um, people every month in Germany reading BuzzFeed um, and we didn't publish content in German, but Germans mostly speak English, especially young people. And so they were reading lots of international media. And if you're, you know, if you're a young person living in Germany, your social feed is going to have maybe two or three languages, four languages in your, in your feed. So media had globalized on its own because of the internet. And we, um, we just followed where, where our content was spreading and started to build local operations in those, those markets. Do you perhaps feel that there are certain types of stories that only work within particular uh, markets and industries? Yeah, I mean, when we first started in the UK, one thing that was working really well in the US was nostalgia content for things like boy bands and cereal that people ate as a kid that you couldn't get anymore, or sodas that people drank, ate as, drank as a kid that you couldn't get anymore. And we, tr we tried to do those in the, in the UK and it didn't work at all. Like, the, the British audience was not that nostalgic for products and <laughs> consumer goods. They were more nostalgic for stories about playing football in, in, in early you know, elementary school or certain, certain uh, na nostalgia for nature or playing outside or things like that. So more wholesome, better, better uh, endeavors. Um, but we're like, well, oh, British people don't get nostalgic. That was like a brief, it was, there was like a brief uh, moment of like, oh, nostalgia isn't something that matters here. And then we realized, okay, it's just a whole s different set of things that, that would uh, inspire nostalgic emotion. Okay, so the audience here today probably has plenty of aspiring entrepreneurs with plenty of ideas. As someone who set up two incredibly successful companies, how do you know when an idea is really going to take off? Uh, it's really hard to know when an idea is going to take off. Mm -hmm. There's there there's something you can. Uh, I was going to use baseball metaphor, but there's probably a cricket metaphor that says that it would be just as as good. But it, it's it's a. Uh, if you have a, everyone has a very low batting average, like it's very hard to get a hit, but, but you can be slightly better than that actually is very valuable. So, so when I think about an idea, 
when you talk about an idea that you're thinking of, if everyone you talk to about it is like, whoa, that's really cool. Like that's a positive sign. Yeah. But a lot of those ideas, you launch them and they still don't work. So it's like, oh, like it still didn't work even though everyone thought that was a great idea. Um, um, if you can put yourself in the perspective, not of the person creating it, but of the person who's using it, that is something that helps a lot. A lot of people struggle with perspective taking. They think, this is an idea I really love and it's going to be great. And they don't stand outside and say, what if I was not involved with this at all and I looked at it from an outside perspective? Would I share this? Would I engage with it? Would I use it? Um, and oftentimes the answer is no. And that's a real problem. Being able to really take the perspective of the consumer or perspective of the audience is, is hugely important and under, under recognized. Um, I think there's also a lot of things that, that um, um, are about timing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, BuzzFeed started too early. Like we were building a social content company when there wasn't any platforms for social content, like Twitter and Facebook were still not really platforms for content when we started. And so we had a several years of not much growth or where we were trying to build something where the market wasn't ready for it. And then as soon as those platforms started to achieve more scale, all of a sudden the market was ready. And I think um, being too early is a challenge and it was tough for us, but we made it through that period. Um, being too late is a, is a problem where everyone else is already doing it and you're trying to sort of chase it. Um, but overall, having one way of having success is looking at something that is, is a year or two out that, you th that, that is a trend that is inevitably going to ha happen. And don't think, how do I create the trend? Think, how can I ride the trend? Like, don't think, how do I make the wave? But you think, ooh, there's a wave forming. How do I surf the wave? And um, and it's a thing that you see a lot of great entrepreneurs do is that they, they have a sense of things that are emerging in culture and they say, huh, if the world moved in that direction, what would the world need? And then they build that and they seem brilliant when they do that. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's, it's not that they are creating some massive trend. It's that they're in touch with what's happening in the world and then they figure out how to uh, build something that, that fits into the way things are going to be in the future and that really serves, serves, serves this future audience or future uh, customer. Okay. So during those early days then, what was it that kept you motivated to keep going with the company? Well, I think you also have to be somewhat masochistic to be an entrepreneur because it, it's, there's, there's uh, a lot of of challenges you know early on it was going to investors and having them say no they didn't want to invest in what we were doing or it's too hard or it's not scalable or you know making content is uh, or doing journalism is too expensive and things like that um, then uh, you have um, um, challenges once you're successful with competitors saying "Ooh, that's a good model I want to do it too and you have a whole bunch of other people doing it so then it's kind of the opposite problem like early on it's that no one's doing it and then it's that a lot of people are doing it you have to figure out how to outcompete them then you also ha when when you um, are smaller it's how do you get noticed how do you people even care when you're bigger it's it's um, how do you um, manage the ecosystem like the platforms of Facebook or Google or other big partners and they say well you're starting to make a lot of ad revenue and we want to make the ad revenue and so you have battles with the sort of complements of, of, of your company so so I, I, I think um, there's no way to really start and build a, comp a big company unless you like the struggle and you like challenges and you like to see situations that seem you know impossible or difficult to get around and and that gets you excited and, and makes you want to say well let me give it a, let me give it a go mm -hmm. so at the moment buzzfeed has a digital only based model do you do you foresee this changing and how do you think that buzzfeed can fit into the broader media landscape we actually sell a lot of cookbooks that are print mm -hmm. i didn't actually realize as someone pointed out you know we are in the print business mm -hmm. we sell uh well, we started selling, per so Tasty is a, is a brand that BuzzFeed created um, and now is the largest media, you know, food brand in terms of, of total reach. It reaches like 500 million plus people every month. Um, and we launched uh, a little over a year ago, we launched a, a custom cookbook where you can say the different types of food you like and then it would generate a cookbook and you can write a message in the front and put emojis in it and personalize it. And then we would print that in a, in a factory that would do real time printing and then ship the customized cookbook to you. So it was print, but it also had a little bit of a, of, of a tech angle to it because it was, it was personalized. Um, and that actually was a huge, you know, actually a, a uh, would have been a, a New York Times best-selling cookbook if, if it had been measured, but it never went to any bookstores or any place that measured it. We sold hundreds of thousands of those. Um, and then we expanded into, uh, 
into more traditional tasty cookbooks that you can buy on Amazon and things like that. So, so, um, so we are a little bit in the print business, but I don't know that's what your, what your question was really. Um, so it was more how, does, how do you see BuzzFeed <laughs> fitting into the broader media landscape? Um, yeah, so I, I think that um, the broader media landscape is going to shift more towards BuzzFeed than we'll shift towards the broader media landscape. So, so digital is just a better way of you know, digital is a better way of doing the media business or, you know, and so if you look at um, traditional media, you have a lot of problems that analog creates and print creates. Um, so people would rather get their news instantly as it happens than wait for the next day and get the newspaper shipped to their house. They'd rather be able to see a story or a piece of entertainment content that they love and be able to share it with their friend and have a conversation with it than to have a, it be in broadcast, you know, uh, format where there's no way to take it and use it to, to talk to someone else. Mm -hmm. People um, would rather have the access to information from around the world. Like you would much rather be able to say, oh, I can read something from the US or from Australia or from, from other places instead of just the town you live in or the country you live in. Um, and people would rather have personalized media where you're seeing things that are of particular interest to you and they're being recommended to you in your personalized news feed or Twitter feed or, or other places. So those are all things that are only possible if it's digital. It's only possible to have access to global information, instant you know, information, personalized information, shareable that you can connect with your friends. And the cost is lower too because you're not having to you know, print out and ship, you know, cut down trees and print things and ship them around in trucks and all that. So, so there's just so many advantages to digital media. And they're not advantages just on a business sense or in the sense of disruption and digital disrupts. It's a sense of serving the consumer and serving the audience better. People like it better. It's, it's, it's something that once you, um, once you experience it, you're not going to go back. Like if you remember you know, watching television as a little kid, if you're homesick from school and you have to hope something good is on and you're flipping through the channels hoping something good is on, like why would you ever go back to that when you can just go to Netflix or YouTube and, and watch the best stuff on the, on the, the service has to offer or stuff that you're passionate about or stuff where you're part of the fandom and you want to watch more of it. So we're never going to go back to things that just don't serve the consumer in a good way. Um, like a, a, you know, flipping through the channels to hope something good is on, or getting your news a week later in a, mag a news magazine. Like, just we, we just won't go back there. Um, and so over time, I think you'll see the media industry take advantage of these um, digital things that digital lets you do, and it's already happening, and it's an inevitable shift that will happen. Um, and BuzzFeed hopefully will lead the way in that. But you're going to see all of media become digital media. Do you think that the death of print media is near then? I think that the that print media bec becomes less and less relevant every day, and the rate of that will depend on the country and depend on the market. I think in the U.S. it will happen a little bit faster than in the U.K., where newspapers are are are, are more um, revered and powerful, and, and there's more of a tradition of newspapers. Um, but I think everywhere you're going to see you're going to see a shift towards digital, and it's going to be bumpy, and and it won't happen in some smooth line. And sometimes it'll happen faster or more slowly than we expect. But it's it's definitely an inevitable shift. So in print, cover stories on both newspapers and magazines are used to reflect the biggest stories and kind of try to create the biggest impact. How do you think that digital media can mirror this? Um, yeah, it's a good question. There is something really powerful about having a, a a cover of a magazine that shows up in the train station and people see it everywhere and there's a lot of value a lot of value to that to signal that something's important um, there's internet versions of that the, the trending modules or the things that are going viral or the thing that even even the story that an editor chooses to put on the front page of the digital you know version of a, a of a publication um, but that is something that I think um, there's, there's still not something that exactly has that same emotional feeling of the, the front of the tabloid or the front of the magazine. Um, and so maybe someone here can invent uh, a, good, a good way to do, the, to, to do that. For a little while at BuzzFeed, we were making front pages for that reason. Like we made, we, when we had big stories, we would make a front page. And that's, there was no magazine. There was just the like, front page. Um, but it was a little too cute. Like I, there's probably a there's probably a, a good way to a better way to solve this, but um. it's coming in the next couple of years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so Facebook recently announced its controversial changes to its newsfeed algorithm. What did you make of those changes? So I think Facebook is always changing their algorithm, mm -hmm. and, and 
we saw a lot of those changes happen last year, and then it, fe it feels like they were announcing some things that they had already done. And then it, Mark Zuckerberg confirmed that in his earnings calls, where he said, well, I actually saw less time spent on Facebook um, because of changes we made um, a few months before they made that announcement. Um, I think that Facebook has a challenge, which is uh, their mission is to connect people, and, and they've always had a bias towards the content that people contribute to Facebook's platform. So your ba baby pictures or pictures of your vacation or things like that. And over the last few years, there's been a continual decline of people posting that kind of content to Facebook. People are posting less of their vacation pictures or their daily life or the food that they ate. And, and so it means Facebook has less and less content being contributed by, by, by their users. Mm -hmm. And that has been offset by con companies like BuzzFeed and other, other media companies putting a lot of professional content onto the platform. And so if your friend has a, a baby or if someone gets married or if there's some life event, you will see that if someone posts it. But then that only happens so often. And so most of the time, you're, it's backfilled with lots of you know, news and entertainment and videos and all kinds of other content. So that happened, and then Facebook got a little freaked out by that trend where they said, whoa, if this keeps happening, eventually we'll just be a news feed, or we'll be a worse version of YouTube, where we'll have a bunch of videos, but we're not as good as YouTube at showing video and monetizing video. And so that's not a direction we want to go in. So we got to figure out how to get more people to post on Facebook. And so they're trying to do that. And it's an example, earlier I talked about when you see a trend, it's good to get in front of the trend. They're in a tough position because they're going against a trend. The trend is people don't want to post as much personal content on Facebook. Um, and they're trying to slow that trend down or stop it or reverse it. And so if you're, I don't know how many of you use you know, Facebook regularly, but they're often showing you stuff from three years ago or six years ago, reminding you of the glorious period when you used to post things on Facebook <laughs> and not just read things on Facebook. And maybe that'll inspire you to do more. Um, or they um, show you a lot of your friends posting stuff and it might not seem like that important of content, but they think if they show you your friend doing it, then you'll say, oh, it's, it's a social norm to post the stuff on Facebook. I want to, um, I want to do more of that. So they're trying to solve a really hard problem. Yeah. And I don't know if they'll be able to solve the problem and whether, and, and they still are very reliant, not on any one publisher, but on publishers in general and people who are making videos and content to, to put into the feed because so much of the time and energy on Facebook now is spent not on seeing just personal content from your friend, but on seeing professional content. And then one final point on that is Facebook actually, um, I think is doing something very smart with this, this change in their algorithm, which is they're focusing on professional content that also connects people together. And that's what BuzzFeed has always done because we started on posting con content on Facebook before Facebook really had content on it. So we always saw our content as, you are gonna share this because it's a way of connecting with your friend. You, sh you don't just take this quiz because you're so curious what Disney princess you are. <laughs> you take this quiz because you wanna see what you got and what your friend got and then you can joke about it and talk about it. And sometimes you might even make fun of the quiz. We don't mind, just so long as you're connecting with your friend and you're, you're getting a, a, a closer connection with your friend. And so looking as a, a, the, the, a great solution to Facebook's challenge is to say, okay, we're never gonna have enough supply of personal content but we can have enough supply of really great content that is social, that, a lot, that is made by companies that, are, that, that understand this, and that helps people connect with each other using the Facebook platform. So you're sharing content because it expresses your identity, because you see yourself in media, because it makes you think of a friend, because it, it, it does a job in your life that matters to you, and it's easier to see something that perfectly encapsulates it and share that than it is to come up with some original post that you, you post your, yourself. And so that's a lot of what BuzzFeed has always done, and this new algorithm change favors content that is, is more per personal and social and allows people to connect with each other, which is more aligned with Facebook's mission. So the changes have largely been good for BuzzFeed then? Yeah, I think the changes are in the long run good for BuzzFeed and in the short term they've been fine for us, but it, but in the, it, it, it has invigorated our team, like especially people who've been at BuzzFeed for a while, because they were like, oh, this is great. This is getting back to the social DNA of Facebook, which is also BuzzFeed's DNA. And there were, you know, there was a period where we would publish content, um, like if you make a post about Beyonce, it would just show that post to everyone who's previously been interested in Beyonce, whether people shared it or not. And so publishers started to just think, oh, oh I'm publishing into an algorithm that's gonna recommend content to people, as opposed to I'm publishing 
for people, and it will be seen by a lot of people if they share it, engage it, and comment on it, and that's really what should matter. And so our team loves that that's what Facebook wants media to be about. It wants to be about this deeper level of engagement, and not just like a Netflix where it's just a recommendation engine and you just make things for a recommendation engine. Um, so overall, it's, it's something that I find uh, in, inspiring and exciting, and I think that it, it will be interesting to see how this larger challenge for Facebook plays out of, you know, I mean, I, I, again, like probably some of you have a lot of friends who are on Facebook, but there's probably some of you who have four or six friends who post on Facebook, and they're not necessarily your best four or six friends, they're just the ones who happen to post on Facebook, so you know everything about their life, you know, and maybe you went to high school with them, or maybe they're like a friend of your aunt or something that somehow you ended up being friends with, and you see everything about them, and it's a little bit weird, and it's only that way because all of your real friends aren't posting on Facebook anymore, or there's not enough of them, and so that puts, uh, that puts Facebook in a, in a bit of a weird situation where they want to show that kind of personal, intimate content, and that's great when you can connect that way, but it's weird if you have 200 friends and and it's a random six of them that are the ones who you see content from because they're the ones who post. And so there's a supply and demand challenge and you know, there's only a limited supply of this personal content and uh, with, with professional publishers, there's an endless supply and the supply shifts based on user needs and so it's an easier source of content for Facebook and they're trying to figure out their, the right balance there so that they can, they can uh, fulfill their mission and, um, and and advance their strategy, and, it's, and it is a challenging time for them. Okay, so moving on to a slightly different question. One of the biggest phenomena the world has seen over the past few years has been the rise of populism, and digital media has arguably had a very big role to play in this. What do you make of the changes that we've seen over recent years, and what do you see BuzzFeed's role being in the years to come? Yeah, populism, like what kind of populism? Uh, political, political activism, mainly. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, an, it's an interesting thing, because a couple of years ago, you would talk to people, like progressive people, and they would say, wow, Facebook and Google are, are these amazing platforms because they're allowing more diversity in media, they're allowing activists and, and people to, to advance their causes. You know, we, in the US, it was like President Obama, the first black president is elected with a message about change, and, um, and, and by the way, has people you know, from Facebook and Snapchat in the Oval Office doing videos, and, and there was this feeling of um, social media being this transformative progressive thing that was driving a, a kind of um, more progressive global culture. Um, then you have Brexit, you have Trump, you have the rise of the alt-right, you have um, a bunch of examples of people using social media for, for different ends, and um, and you see people who two years ago loved these social platforms and were actually saying, I hope these social platforms don't regulate speech and keep things open, you know, to now seeing the same people saying, oh, these social platforms are ruining democracy and giving voice to all of these terrible things and I hope the social platforms don't, you know, do, do clamp down on this content. And, and so it, it's, uh, if your side is winning, I think it's, it's easy to embrace the trend of digital media and social media and saying, wow, our side is winning and this is, this is, this is why. Um, and the, answer, the truth is I think it's a lot more complicated um, yeah. you know, in, the, in the sense that um, you know, it is great that you, know, I, you think about my earliest childhood where, I, where you, know, you remember there was, there was you know, three television network news shows with three, diff, you know, three white men who all looked almost the same, who read basically identical news, and that was how you got your news. Like, was that good to have essentially no diversity, ne you know, having whole groups of people never see themselves in media, having um, a very homogenized message? Like, no, that's obviously not, not, not good. We don't want to go back to that. Or having a couple newspapers that are the only source of information and, and all the stuff I was saying before about not being able to get global information and all of that. We don't want to go back to that. Um, and on the other hand, do we want to have, you know, ISIS videos and hate crimes and fake news and, you know, things like that proliferating, getting shared? Like, no, of course we don't want that either. And so we have to find a way to build a par partnerships between tech and media and to build um, st stronger models for, for delivering what is good about the open internet and what is good about these giant global platforms and combine that with what is good about things like traditional journalistic values and, and content that 
um, um, standards that exclude the most hateful types of content and things that are are corrosive to democracy and and um, undermined you know civic civic society. And so it's it's a it's a it's a big challenge and I think it's one of the most important challenges right now is how do we how do we how do we build towards towards something that um, takes what is good about the the internet and the global glo you know global global platforms and social media and and combines it with with a a more sophisticated sense of how those things those platforms should be managed uh, for for societal good mm -hmm. do you think that social media companies have a certain level of responsibility in making sure that they filter out the fake news and the hate speech yeah they have a huge re they have a huge responsibility i mean they they are um you know, if you if you talk to some people in Silicon Valley, the, they they talk about AI being on this trajectory where soon it will be smarter than people, and um, there's a, a pretty widely held belief in cer certain some circles that many jobs that we thought um, could only be done by humans will be done by algorithms, mm -hmm. and and um, you know already certain legal jobs are being done by algorithms, and so if you look at these platforms. Um, they're using algorithms to do an editorial function. In some ways, they're replacing editors with an algorithm that's deciding what's on the front page or what shows up high in the, you know, in the feed. Um, and so it's it's a human job that's being done by computers, and it's being done poorly in many cases um, yeah. when it comes to things like fake news or hate speech or or um, certain types of troll content or spam content. But it's actually doing a better job than humans in other senses, which is it's able to process so much data and, and look at so much content across you know, a massive universe and actually show people stuff that they really like. And every time a company, a social media company, implements an algorithmic feed, their time spent goes up and people spend more time on the platform and like the platform better. So technology is actually better at doing some jobs than humans, but it's much worse at doing other jobs. Mm -hmm. And so we need to find ways for some human judgment to come into in the areas where right now computers are failing us or, or algorithms are failing us. Um, but we also need to understand that with the amount of content being created globally around the world, there's no way that, that, um, that individual humans or moderators are going to be able to process it all in, a, in an effective way. Okay. Um, I think on that note, then we'll open up to some audience questions, if that's okay. Uh, I can see a hand just at the front over there. If you don't like it, never. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, you founded the Huffington Post as a group blogging platform and it's since rebranded. Um, I was wondering what you think about that as well as the decision to close the contributor platform. Sure. Yeah, so when HuffPost started, we had a group blog and then on, on the left side and then we had uh, something like a left-leaning drudge report, kind of, kind of link, links and aggregation that linked out to other places. Um, and at the time we launched, blogging was was very hot, like it was the thing that people were writing about and doing thought pieces about blogging. Um, but it was always about people blogging in their pajamas. And, and so people who had a voice and people who were on TV and people who wrote write op-eds for the newspaper never blogged, because why would you? And what HuffPost did is it took a bunch of people who, had, um, who were more prominent people and, and said, write in this new casual style of blogging and do it whenever you feel like it and, and don't go pitch a, you know, have a long pitch process with a newspaper or get booked on a, on a show. Just, just write from your heart and write things that, that matter to you. And, um, and, you know, people like, you know, like, uh, you know, leaders, that, you know, politicians and presidents and senators and celebrities and all these different people took us up on it and, and blogged on Huffington Post. And it was never the thing that drove the most traffic or the most reach, but it was something that had the, uh, maybe the biggest mind share about what, uh, what is Huffington Post and what was new and different about Huffington Post. Um, then once we sold the company to AOL and you know, some people, some people uh, and the blogging network expanded and it wasn't always super bold faced names, but it was a really started to be thousands of people. Um, some people said, "Well, why are these? Why are people contributing for free on Huffington Post, and it's unpaid labor?" And and you know, our view was was well, you know, they can publish whenever they want. It's like appearing on a television show where you know, or a news program. You don't get paid for that, but you have a big platform. And you can reach a lot of people. You can publish whenever you want. It's voluntary. It's not something that you know. You're not like working for us. You're you're using this platform to to advance um, your voice and. And, and, and so that's how we thought of it. I think after Huffington Post sold and after it became more of a bigger business, people started to say, well, that's, is that fair? And there also was so many different people publishing. 
And I think we always knew internally that that those blogs were not the thing that was driving a lot of the growth of Huffington Post. The things people were coming for increasingly was the reporting and and the you know uh, links out to other stories and and and, and things like that. Um, and so I haven't been involved with Huffington Post for for a long time now, so I don't know their their internal conversations. But based what I you know I was involved up until the company sold to AOL. Um, but based on that early experience, I would say um, probably at a certain point they said. It's a lot of work to manage all these contributors. Um, it's unclear what the employment relationship is with them, and it and it isn't actually adding that much to, to what what we're we're doing. Let's let's focus on on our paid staff creating the content. So that's what I would guess. Thank you. Um, should you go to the hand just over there in the aisle? Earlier on, you mentioned a few of the problems that like companies face as they're growing. So one of them was like being too small to get noticed, and then competitors springing up against you, and also like getting funding. Can you give us an idea of the methods that you used to like, or an insight into some of the methods you might have used to like overcome these problems? Yeah. So the the getting noticed piece, I think, being part of a larger trend is really important, which I mentioned before, and then being bold and doing things that are noteworthy, not just for your company but for the industry as a whole, um, is 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 a is is something that can cause people to pay attention. Say, ooh, wow, they're doing something that really really makes makes sense to push the industry forward. Um, the on the on the competitive side, I think um, you know outrunning people is one. Being being you know having Better talent, more capital, um, a bigger reach, a head start—you know—all of that can, can help. Also, building strong brands that, that that people care about. Also, diversifying across multiple platforms and multiple um, business models and, and and ad revenue models, so that you you can um, move more quickly as as things shift and change in in, in the industry. Um, tech and data is often a strong way to differentiate from competitors. So, if you're able to to to, to uh, um, have better analytics and data science and and tracking and tech and you know for a long time BuzzFeed was when BuzzFeed's website just loaded faster and worked better in mobile because the, the a lot of the traditional websites were bolting together lots of different pieces of software that were made for desktop and not mobile and they didn't really know how to, to how to make that shift because they weren't in control of their own technology so so I think there's um, um, but it's it's it is like the big question in business is you know how do you stay ahead and how do you you know how do you get traction and grow new things and then how do you stay ahead and, and fend off, off off competitors but those are a few a few ways that we think about it. Um, should go to the hand just over there. Yeah. Um, you had a lot of personal success early on with things going viral, uh, like the Nike ID, uh, Black People Love Us, uh, New York Rejection Line. How do you think that has helped shape your and BuzzFeed's understanding of what is it that actually makes thing co things go viral? Yeah, so um, when I was, a, I was a grad student at MIT and I was studying um, educational technology and doing research at the MIT Media Lab, and I was procrastinating writing my master's thesis, um, and like a lot of you probably know, when you're procrastinating, you look for any other thing you can do. Or and and I had heard Nike had just launched this thing called Nike ID, where you could customize your shoes. And so I I tried to customize a pair of Nike shoes with the word sweatshop to see like would they send me a pair of Nikes that say sweatshop underneath. Um, and they wrote back and they said you know they took they accepted the order and then the next day I got an email that said the word sweatshop is inappropriate slang so you can't put them on the shoes. Um, and so I responded, no, it's it's in the dictionary. It means a shop or factory where workers toil under unhealthy conditions. You know, now can you send me the shoes? Um, and then they wrote back, an, you know, another excuse. And we were having this back and forth, which was perfect for me because I was procrastinating. So instead of writing my <laughs> thesis, I was like writing back and forth with this customer service rep. And then eventually they said, listen, we reserve the right to reject, you know, any uh, any ID. You have to change the ID. And I said, okay, fine, I'll change the ID. But can you at least send me a picture of the ten-year-old Vietnamese girl who stitches the shoes together? And um, and then they didn't write back after that. Um, <laughs> and I never got the shoes. And so this was in January of 2001. So before YouTube, before you know Facebook, before people thought about things going viral. Um, but in the dark ages of social media, there were these things called email forwards. And my correspondence with Nike, I sent to 12 friends, and then they started passing it on to their friends, and it ended up reaching um, millions of people. I ended up on the number one morning show with uh, 
uh, Nike's head of global P PR, like debating sweatshop labor, which I knew nothing about, um, <laughs> because this thing had gone so viral. And to me, it was this th moment where I was like, oh, what, what does it mean that a student with no connections in the media can create something that is seen by millions of people, and there was never an editor who said, put it on the front page, and there was never someone who said, put this on in prime time, and it, and it, and it um, spread entirely through people's passing things around. So that was sort of the first, my first experience with thinking about media through this lens of networks instead of broadcast. Like, what, what does it mean if um, we're all connected to each other by th um, six degrees of separation and we're all connected to each other in what's called small world networks and information can spread through those networks. But that was just um, in the 1970s when those, those terms were coined and that social science research was done, it was kind of an intellectual novelty or parlor game. We might be connected by six degrees of separation. All of a sudden you had the internet that connected everyone and now all of a sudden it meant you could, act in, in real life, you could make something, share it with people and it could end up saturating a network and reaching huge audiences. So that was the sort of first insight. And then I think after that insight that was more about the network science of it, 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 there was this question of, okay, what's the psychology of it? So there's an individual person who has to make a decision. I'm going to forward this on and, or I'm not going to forward this on. And how do they make that decision? With a Nike email, some of it was they were activists because they, and they wanted to forward it because they cared about this cause. Some of it was that they forwarded it because it was funny. And so they, they were forwarding it for humor just to entertain their friend and have a laugh with their friend. And humor is a big way of, of people connecting with each other. Um, and so I started to, to sort of look at, can I make more things like that? And you mentioned like Rejection Line and Black People Love Us, which are another two, you know, two other projects that I, I made with my sister as a stand-up comic, um, where we, we made some, project, you know, some other projects to try to study this and try to understand it. And a lot of what early BuzzFeed was about was trying to understand well, why is it that people, we know that everyone's connected, but only sometimes do these networks matter and do people start sharing things. What's the psychology of that and what's the social psychology of it? And we found that it was kind of complicated, just like people are complicated. Sometimes you share um, an article because you want to look smart. And so you're sharing it, you know, not because of the information in it, but because it's an impressive article to, to share. I'm sure no one at Oxford does that, but like sometimes <laughs> people have been, you know, known to do that. Um, sometimes people share uh, so something because it expresses who they are better than they can express it themselves. So, you know, we had content about like signs you're from the north of England or signs that you're left handed or um, signs that you grew were raised by Asian immigrant parents. And people would share that, that content because it was a way of connecting with people with a similar experience, but they would also share it because it was a way of telling people who are different from them. This is how I grew up or this is what my life is like. And so we started to tr try to understand that. Um, and then the, the layering on also the platforms, which became really important, which is sometimes networks are really ready to have content diffuse, and other times it's difficult. Um, one metaphor for this is uh, of a forest. So if a forest has lots of dry underbrush and the trees are really close together and it's a really hot day, a little spark can light, will light the whole forest on fire and it might burn forever. Um, but if you have a forest that's really green and there's not much underbrush, you could take a flamethrower to it and it wouldn't spread. Um, and so sometimes you might make a brilliant, funny thing that people really would want to share, but you're putting it on the wrong network and that network's not connected enough and it doesn't go anywhere, even though it has all of the right, the right sort of elements. Um, so you can look at the content itself and what are the qualities of that. You can look at the people who are sharing it and you can look at the network and say, how are people connected to each other? And all of those three things are interacting and, and, and that has a big effect on what, sh what spreads and what doesn't spread. Um, and it keeps changing as human psychology and these platforms um, are also you know, changing and, and, and evolving with, with culture. Uh, should we go to the hand right at the back over there? I know BuzzFeed does have like a news component, but it's also really well known for its um, kind of more clickbaity content, like listicles and quizzes and things. And I wonder if you could comment on whether that's made a positive or negative impact on the mo modern online digital media and landscape. Sure. So, um, so we have a, a, a pretty de uh, defined way of thinking about what clickbait is. So we don't we don't consider ourselves to do clickbait, um, but uh, but. Uh, like for, for us, uh, clickbait means a headline that misrepresents a story and 
you click it because you know, or or a headline that says you'll never believe what you'll see, and then you click it, and it doesn't actually deliver on it because it's trying to get get a click um, and and gaming the click. Um, when we have a story like which Disney princess are are you, I'm it's it's uh, very tempting for a lot of people to click that, but it actually when you get there, there is a quiz about which Disney princess you are, so it matches. Um, so it's not clickbait. People should know what they're gonna should should know what they're gonna get. Um, and then when people actually take the quiz and find out which Disney princess they are, um, the purpose of that is not um, uh, uh, the, the the service to the world is not um, letting that individual know what Disney princess they are. The service is help giving that person a way of connecting with other people in their life. So they, when they share a quiz with someone else, they'll take the they'll take the quiz as well, and they'll get an answer. And then you'll joke and talk about um, that with your with your friend. And so if you look at a lot of our entertainment content. Um, if you look at it in isolation and you say, is this content important? The answer would be no. Um, is this content um, a beautiful work of art? Oftentimes the, the, the answer is no. Occasionally we have our moments. Um, the purpose of the content, of, of that kind of social content, is that someone will share it with their friend and say, hey, we should cook this together this weekend. And it's a, it's a, it's a quick, tasty video of, of something that would be fun to cook with your friend. Um, or, um, oh my God, this is so us, and it's a it's a it's a list a list about best friends and doing silly things together, and that connection between the best friends or the people cooking something together um, or the people comparing their quiz results to each other um, is a is a way to connect people with each other socially, and so um, I evaluate that content and that work from from a maybe more zoomed out perspective of looking at this ecosystem of social connection on, on the internet. Um, it's kind of what I was just talking about with the earlier question about the Nike email or, so, or some of those things, which is um, how is how what, looking at the individual content, looking at the job it does for an individual person, and then looking at how it connects them to a larger network. Um, and so that's really the, 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 the mission there. And we regularly see content that clicks incredibly well that doesn't Serve that mission, and we we avoid doing that kind of kind of content, and we avoid doing uh, uh, things that game clicks or are only about achie <coughs> achieving a metric, but aren't actually providing uh, service and value for for people and their and their friends. I think we've maybe got time for one more question. So if we go to the hand just over there, yeah. So um, you talked a little bit about fake news, um, and I think one of the challenges of having a platform where media can be created by individuals other than traditional reporters and journalists is that um, it's increasingly easy to report false information. Um, and so I was wondering how BuzzFeed has addressed or tried to come to terms with this particular issue. Yeah, so one thing that we've done a lot of is, is content that is about debunking fake news. So we have a lot of journalists where their beat is looking for things that are being distributed widely that are, that are fake, not true, you know, not not supported, and oftentimes a really good post debunking these this kind of content or video debunking it um, actually is people people share as a service. It's like you you share it like don't be fooled by this, and so um, a correction doesn't really have that same effect. So you know, uh, and, and that's a different issue. But if a if a credible news source writes a correction, one of the problems is that. Very few people see the correction. A lot of people see the original story. But if you do a good job debunking stories, um, particularly now, people really love 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 to know. Hey, this wasn't real, and this was real. And I like to keep a kind of catalog of things that um, that people may think are real that aren't. That that you know, there there was one Im image that was pretty popular among people like on the left in the U.S. that said it was a picture of Donald Trump, and it said. Um, if I ever run a younger picture of Donald Trump, was like if I ever ran for president, I'd run as a Republican because those voters are so you know yeah. gullible or whatever. And it was like a totally fake. But um, people who are outraged about fake news um, and would talk about it, and you'd be like, they would think that they, some of them think that is real, you know. And so part of the problem is that we're much more e easily fooled when something confirms our bias and confirms what we already believe. Um, and that's why we're not always a great guide of ourselves of what's real and what's fake because we will be taken in by something that we want to believe. Um, and so news organizations that um, have a deep understanding of the internet and a deep understanding of how these things spread are often um, in, a, 
in a unique position to be able to, to figure out what's, what's real and what's not real and debunk it and write about it and expose it. Um, and so that's important work that we do. And I think there's, there's others who are, who are doing this as, uh, as well. Um, and you know, there, there's uh, become this weird phenomenon that, that media companies are essentially doing pro bono fact checking for these giant platforms where we have like paid journalists who are going and finding the things on YouTube and on Facebook and saying, hey, this is wrong and this is wrong. And they're like, oh, thank you. We've taken those down. And you're like, you know, and so you're like, okay, like this is nice, but you should also figure out how to, how to police and manage your own platforms better because um, there's only so many, so many journalists we can hire to do this and, and these platforms are pretty vast. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately that's all we've got time for today, um, but please join me in saying a huge thank you to Jonah for joining us here today.